as a way of background, we know that approximately 20% of breast cancers overexpress HER2, and half of these patients also have the estrogen receptor co-expressed. Anti-HER2 therapies have improved survival outcomes, but unfortunately, resistance remains inevitable for the majority of patients. There is a very strong rationale for blocking CDK4-6 in HER2 positive disease, and we know that palbociclib is an agent that has been associated with an improved outcomes for patients diagnosed with metastatic ER positive disease. So the patina phase three study included patients diagnosed with metastatic ER positive and HER2 positive disease, and these patients are treated with chemotherapy and trastuzumab based regimens prior to randomization. And this is basically using a regimen that we have as a standard of care that's called THP, where patients get six to eight cycles of chemotherapy with anti HER2 agents. And then we drop the chemotherapy regimens, and patients continue on this maintenance regimen with anti HER2 therapies. So that's how the study starts after this standard of care induction phase with a few cycles of chemotherapy. And we randomized 518 patients to receive palbociclib with anti HER2 therapy and endocrine therapy, or the anti HER2 therapy and endocrine therapy in the control arm. Patients were followed until toxicity or disease progression. The study had important stratification factors, including the type of anti HER2 therapy, dual versus single HER2 blockade. If patients were exposed with anti-hergeal therapies in the early stage setting when they were diagnosed initially with breast cancer, the response that they had to this induction chemotherapy before randomization and the type of hormonal therapies that were allowed in the study, which are fovestrant and AI, which is an aromatase, aromatase inhibitor. The study has primary, as a primary endpoint progression-free survival, and it was designed with a 90% power to detect a hazard ratio of 0.66. Secondary objectives are overall survival, with a final overall survival analysis planned at 247 events. This is a study that enrolled from June 2017 through July 2021 in eight participating countries. This is an academic trial conducted by Alliance Foundation trial when we got the results just 10 days ago. We're very impressed with the results and we are very thankful to the SABS committee organizers for allowing us to add this into the program. The median age of our study population was 53. Majority of our patients were white and the number of cycles of treatment before randomization was balanced across arms. This is important when we say that the dual anti HER2 blockade was used in 97% of the study population. This follows the standard of care. 90% of patients were treated with aromatase inhibitor. And the response that patients had to this induction regimen was similar across the study arm. And it's a very high response rate. This THP that we use in clinical setting before when patients are diagnosed with recurrent disease, it's an active regimen with a 68% response rate. So let's review our primary endpoint, which is the final progression-free survival analysis of the PATINA trial. We can see in the red curve the superiority of the palbociclib containing ARM with a median PFS of 44.3 months when compared to 29.1 months in the control arm with, hazard ratio, with a hazard ratio of 0.74, which translates into a 26% reduction in risk and a significant p-value at 0.0074. We can see that the curves, they separate early and they remain split over many years of follow-up with almost a 10% benefit improvement in absolute terms at 60 months of follow-up. The benefit of palbociclib was sustained across the stratification subgroups, and here we have prior anti HER2 therapy in the earlier stage settings. So patients benefit if they did receive anti HER2 agents or not prior to the study enrollment or when they are diagnosed initially with breast cancer, and the response that they had to this induction chemotherapy, if they had a complete response, partial response versus a stable disease. Here we have a secondary objective, which is a confirmed overall response and clinical benefit rate. I want to raise uh, your attention to see that 
to mention that this is response defined from the time of randomization. So this is additional response on top of the high response rate seen with DHP. And we see the superiority of palbociclib in terms of confirmed overall response and the clinical benefit rate. The overall survival data is immature at this stage. We have just 109, 119 events out of the planned 247. The median overall survival has not been achieved in the palbociclib arm, and it's seven, seven months in the control arm. The five-year overall survival estimate shows a 74.3% for uh, the palbociclib arm versus 69.8 in the control arm, with a hazard ratio point estimate of 0.86. Now let's review the toxicity profile of this agent and the results from this study. This, ta this table includes adverse events, grade two or higher, that were present in at least 10% of the patients. We saw neutropenia, fatigue, and stomatitis being more common in the palbociclib arm. Neutropenia was the most common adverse event. And this is consistent with what we know with the toxicity profile of palbociclib. Uh, for the current labeling indication for the patients with ER positive, HER2 negative in our clinical practices. Diarrhea was more common with palbociclib, with grade 2 and 3 being 26 and 11 versus 10 and 2. I want to point out that the incidence of high grade, grade 4 or higher adverse, adverse events was similar across ARM. Treatment discontinuation due to adverse events was very rare, so just 7% in the palbociclib arm, and there were no treatment-related deaths reported in this study. So our results really reinforce the scientific rationale for overcoming resistance to anti-HER2 therapy and endocrine therapy by the addition of palbociclib in this setting. Palbociclib, when added to this regimen, demonstrated a statistically significant improvement in PFS. And it's important to say that the toxicity profile was manageable and we don't see new safety signals. So how do we put this into clinical practice? The phase three study put in a trial really demonstrates a clinically meaningful improvement in PFS for patients diagnosed with ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer. The median PFS in the control arm being 29 months far exceeds our expectations. And despite that, we see an improvement of greater than a year once we add palbociclib into this regimen. The toxicity profile was manageable, and I would argue that when palbociclib is added to anti-HER2 and endocrine therapy, this may represent a new standard of care for patients diagnosed with ER positive, HER2 positive breast cancer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so are you going to file for FDA approval based on the results of this trial? Thank you. Yes, we have plans to engage with the regulatory authorities, not just in the U.S., but outside the U.S., because we feel that this data is compelling and uh, hopefully should be a regimen that's uh, widely available for patients diagnosed with ear positive or HER2 positive breast cancer. And I, I wanted to make sure I was double-checking my math. This median PFS, we're talking about almost four years of median PFS, patients staying on the first-line regimen for four years. Thank you. Yeah, this is totally correct because the induction phase prior to the randomization takes about four to six months, and we have a median PFS superior to 40 months. So we're talking about patients being on a treatment that's well tolerated where patients continue to work and, and continue well with their lives despite being on treatment for uh, metastatic breast cancer for four years, which is remarkable. So come Monday morning, what are you going to do in clinic with patients that have triple positive metastatic breast cancer? That's an excellent and provocative question. I wish that we could say that we could use this medication, but we don't have it approved for this specific indication. But we do have important messages from this study. When the Cleopatra, which is the previous regimen that we used, was designed, hormonal therapy was not included in the control arm. When we see here 29 months 
Gideon PFS in the control arm, I would say that this study supports the common use of endocrine therapy. So if there are clinicians that are no longer or not using hormonal therapy with HP in the maintenance study, I would say that this should be added, and hopefully we'll have ways to add bubocyclib soon. Perfect. Any questions from? Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Lynn Peterson with Trends in Medicine. So is there a reason to think that Palvo is different from the, um, its other drugs in the class? Thank you. This is an important question. I would say that what our study, which is a registration phase three study, shows is that we're seeing a benefit with the addition of palbocyclib. And while we have seen that different CDK46 inhibitors may have a similar activity in different settings, this should not be extrapolated to the safety of having this combined with different agents. So I would argue that the data that we have at the moment, it's only with palbocyclib. Now, we also have data with abemocyclib as far as uh, her positive disease. Um, obviously, that was not phase three clinical trial data. This is. Um, if you were to use, at this point, a CDK4-6 inhibitor in this setting, it would be palbocyclib? That's correct. I would use palbocyclib for this specific setting, which is the first-line setting, the metastatic setting, because that's where we have data from a phase three clinical trial confirming the benefits of CDK4-6 inhibitors. It's nice to see that we have data with different agents, agents that, and in smaller studies, which reinforces the concept that blocking the CDK4-6 pathway to be very important in her positive disease. And, and as you can all imagine, uh, Dr. Metzger didn't just wake up one morning and decide to test CDK4-6 inhibitors in triple positive breast cancer. There was very good preclinical rationale to using these agents in this setting, which is, which is why this study was done. So this study uh, confirms what we all expected to see and believed based on, 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 on the results of preclinical data that CDK4-6 inhibitors are active in, in, in HER2-positive, ER-positive disease. Any other questions? I have one question from Zoom. This one's for you, Dr. Kaklamani. Uh, this is from Alice Goodman with the ASCO Post, and she asks if you could please give a comment that summarizes the importance of this study. Yeah, so this is extremely important. We, we know based on a lot of studies, including the Cleopatra trial, that patients that have metastatic or positive breast cancer live for a very long time, and they've surpassed, we've surpassed the five-year overall survival. And so I, I describe this disease, it's a chronic disease, and I describe our treatment as a marathon and not a sprint. So if we're gonna be giving cytotoxic therapy, meaning chemotherapy, and many of the antibody drug conjugates that we give up front and give them more aggressively, we're gonna cause a lot of side effects to our patients and they may not be able to tolerate later on therapies. So treatments such as this that in, in, in a sense delay the use of chemotherapy, and, and Dr. Metzger hasn't shown us this, but obviously it's pretty obvious that this, is, that this happened, are extremely welcome to the community and to the physicians and to the patients. So for me, and, 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 and this has been a question mark for a long time, and many of us have, have dabbled into giving CDK4-6 inhibitors in, in triple positive breast cancer, and now we have more definitive data to do that. Uh, but this is important because there are two pathways that are activated in this cancer. It's the estrogen pathway and the HER2 pathway. And trying to tackle both at the same time seems to benefit patients. And the good news is that tackling the estrogen pathway doesn't increase substantially the toxicity, whereas tackling the HER2 pathway by adding chemotherapy does increase the toxicity. So these regimens are important because they help maintain the quality of life of our patients for a longer period of time. Any other questions? Perfect. Thank you. This concludes our...